what um, Jane told me today. Yeah. Are we on? Are we live? What? This clock's ticking. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the meeting tonight. Um, it's particularly nice to meet. Welcome Andrew Pennell and Gary Johnson um, from H.L. Hutchinson and Cropwise. We're going to be talking to us about um, uh, a day in the life of a crop doctor, which I think will be very different to um, what we're used to. But they may, it's by the sound of it, they've got some similar sort of problems to the ones that um, we have. I'd also like to particularly welcome Fiona, Fiona MacDonald. Um, uh, she's a, a lecturer at Askham Brown College, so uh, she's a, a, a great friend of ours, and uh, I have the uh, um, the pleasure of playing golf with her father on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the family is far nicer. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but, I should have him at him beat I think he's just better than me. <laughs> and he practices more. <laughs> There's a few bits just to um, run through. Um, obviously, our last meeting was on the 23rd of September um, when we had Brian Ferguson talking about uh, investing in prevention. Um, his talk was obviously, to, um, from Public Health England point of view, was talking about things like the uh, sugar tax and the, the surprise that that brought, that minimum pricing for alcohol and the benefits that actually that could bring. Um, we did touch on things like vaccinations and things. Um, and it, he actually managed to turn around and say that Jeremy Hunt was actually listening, which um, seemed very strange to us all. <laughs> um, we have a few apologies for tonight from Catherine Griffith, uh, Mike Harron, Delith Wynne Jones, and Greg Richardson. Um, we've got one new member for um, uh, voting on. So, can I have somebody to uh, come and do the. It's, um, Mark Robinson, who I believe is a consultant hematologist at um, York Hospital. This is only for the members of the free. No, no, I appreciate uh, the explanation. But they can obviously be uh, blackballed, <laughs> so. Or I think that's some person on the side by mistake. <laughs> If you put it in the next side, it's going to put it in the count. There's no one partition. I will follow it. I wonder if partition doesn't go all the way down. I have a feeling. Sadly, we have got four resignations that Andrew Coatsworth, Guy Millman, Jeff Clark, and Dominic Smith have all resigned. So. I don't, know how, I don't know how active they've been in the society. But, um, and one death report, there was um, David Wilkinson, um, whose funeral was yesterday. Um, he was a radiologist in New York for many years. Um, his um, wife who predeceased him was Hazel. So um, Robert and I were there at the, his funeral yesterday, weren't we? Oh, indeed. Yeah. Just, not just in body. So. Now, before welcoming our two speakers, or speaker and uh, psychic. Um, as you know, I, 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 I like to. Um, um, uh, well, Gary says he's going to the psychic. <laughs> I keep wanting to promote Selby. And. Somebody's got to. Is it working? Sorry. I don't want to tell you, Is it working? Sometimes it needs a couple of minutes, John, to warm up. Uh, it's confined. Yeah. Selby Hill. It's, 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 it's on. No, it's on. That's it. That's it. So last time I told you about um, Jonathan Hutchinson, famous um, uh, Salibian. 
I don't know if any of you have heard of Smith's yes, tenant. Absolutely. Uh, he was born in Selby in 1761 in Finkel Street, which is right, um, <laughs> just next door to the um, uh, Abbey. And this is the blue plaque that is um, there. Um, went to Burnley Grammar School. I think. His family came from the from the Dales, in actual fact, and obviously had quite a lot of land up there. He went to my alma mater for a short while, but didn't like it and ended up in Cambridge. Um, uh, got his FRS uh, in 1785, um, uh, MB in 1788, and an MB in 1906. In 1804, his fame was that he um, discovered osmium and iridium uh, from solution to platinum ores. Um, and also he contributed to the proof of identity of charcoal and diamond. Um, iridium was named for the colours of it when dissolving it in acid, uh, and osmium for the strange smell, which was apparently um, osmium tetroxide, which um, is not a good thing to be smelling, I'm told it's very, very toxic. <laughs> 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 so it didn't last long then. Uh, well, you, you, you went on all right for a while. Um, these are all um, related to, to platinum. Um, uh, iridium is... Uh, very high melting point, but you'll see osmium is even higher still. Um, and osmium is the most dense element. Um, mm. So, um, and, um, I think that iridium is used, I think it's iridium that's used in um, pens and things like this. Nice. He died oh. in France whilst the bridge collapsed yeah. underneath him. Good girl. Oh, really unlucky. Interestingly, his mother had died falling from a horse. So, this is the uh, rather lonely street that's named after him in Selby, um, um, which is next, literally next door to um, uh, Hutchinson Street, which I told you about last time. So uh, there is a Smithson Tenant Prize that's awarded at Selby High School. And uh, for many years, the head of chemistry there was the person who actually devised who was going to get it. His daughter is here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a link there. I've never got the prize. I've never got the prize. Anyway, that's enough of me. I'll leave you to sort this out, Andrew. So, can I welcome um, Gary and Andrew to, to talk? Um, Gary, I've known for many, many years. Um, I knew uh, one of his ex partners as well. I used to play rugby with one of his ex partners. Uh, one of the other ones used to be very big in the rugby club, a bit older. He sadly died about 20 years ago, I believe. Yeah, okay. Probably something like that. Uh, so, um, having heard about Gary walking all the fields, I, I asked if he would come. And he, he managed to ask Andrew to come and do all the hard work. <laughs> Andrew is a uh, trade in Nottingham. Um, uh, and uh, is an agronomist by profession, um, and he tells me he's head of the field-based IT for Rachel Hutchison, which is fantastic because he's, he's sorting out all the IT here, and it's great. <laughs> um, and uh, they've got over 200 agronomists uh, from Cornwall to Aberdeen, so we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, thank you. Andrew said that he would like to have questions during it to make sure that you're all awake. <laughs> <laughs> try and walk about a bit actually but I do have a few notes on here which I'd like to refer to so uh, but I will just walk about a bit as I talk. So uh, a day in the life of a crop doctor. This is a bit a bit of an indulgence for me because um, I quite like uh, presenting uh, lectures like this and one of the reasons that I quite like doing that is because uh, throughout my career I've managed to um, uh, get myself a professional photography qualification and one of the things that I do for Hutchinson's is I take photographs for the, the media and for websites and so any chance for me to show off my photographs uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I sort of take, take that opportunity. Uh, I'll try not to go on too much about my photographs but actually this is, this is a, this I took on the Isle of Butte uh, with the sun behind this tractor and I just thought it made a really nice uh, silhouette. The screen's a little bit grainy, but I think it's okay. I think, it, uh, I think it's okay. So yes, yeah, so I just uh, got the sun behind the tractor and then just darkened the sky. I cheated a bit with Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> so a day in the life of the crop doctor. Um, you tell us what Hudson's 
Yes, I'm certainly going to tell you. I'm certainly going to tell you what virtues these are. Actually, uh, being very topical, uh, I thought I'd start off with a with a picture of um, of uh, pumpkins out there in the field in Norfolk. But basically, um, Hutchinson's uh, is the second lar largest agrochemical uh, and fertilizer and seed and supplier of advice. In, uh, in the UK, and uh, we have 200 crop production specialists, agronomists, crop advisors, sometimes they call themselves crop doctors, and we stretch from Cornwall right the way up to Aberdeen, as far as the east coast, and in the west we go as far as the Welsh border, and actually we don't really go particularly far into Wales, but we go as far as the Welsh border and into Lancashire. We have altogether, there are 200 agronomists, about just over 400 employees, so the, the other 200 support the agronomists. And, and an agronomist, for those of you that don't know, uh, we have an agronomist here on the, on the left, an agronomist is a, a link really between uh, the farmer and plant, science and, uh, plant scientists and, and researchers. And someone that um, really can become the farmer's right hand man or right hand lady and uh, helps him or her growing, uh, growing their crops. You can look at various figures, and there's, there's uh, around 10,000 farmers uh, in the UK. But probably, probably um, those ten, sorry, there's various figures. Some will say there's 100,000 farmers, but there's probably about 10,000 farmers that would seek uh, agronomic advice. And there's about 1,000 a, a agronomists practicing. Probably about a thousand, and this is a, a ballpark figure. So you can compare this, you can perhaps compare this to your own profession. I know a lot about my profession, not much about yours, except we call ourselves crop doctors. So about a thousand agronomists, and agronomists will look after um, farms of varying size, various uh, size. Uh, some agronomists would just look, look after one, one unit, uh, some would look after 50 or more. It depends. It just depends on the size of the unit and how they're geographically located, for example. But farmers need technical advice and uh, so conduit. Would they, would they help us? It's easy to invite in questions. Would yeah, no, certainly. Yes, yes, uh, livestock farmers. Agronomists would no. Agro agronomists would be. Um, so it's just for arable. It is just for arable. Yeah. Um, so livestock farmers aren't interested in knowing how to grow grass better. Is really sorry, sorry, no, no, actually, you, you're exactly right. Yeah, agronomists would advise on the growing of crops, but they wouldn't advise on animal health. Okay. So, um, so, um, grass. so they would they would advise on the growing of pasture or sure. grass for seed okay. or for hay, certainly. Yeah. 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 Um, traditionally, less intensive than combinable crops, but nevertheless, agronomists would advise on that. So. Could you just see what I'm, I'm very simple person? There's thousands of agronomists and 10,000 farmers. <coughs> I don't see many farmers per agronomist, is it? No, that's right. That's but right. farmers have a lot of land. That's right. So it's more about the land that you look after, I suppose, in a way. Yeah, um, our company looks after about a million hectares. And um, an, an, an agronomist would supervise the growing of crops on 10,000, sorry, uh, uh, I'll say in hectares, an agronomist would supervise the growing of crops on uh, 4,000 to 8,000 hectares. Uh, but an agronomist can have quite a lonely life, can spend quite a lot of time out in the fields uh, looking at crops all day long and not really, not really see anyone. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that what made you pick up a camera? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's not. <laughs> so there's something in the field of oilseed ray, agronomist and farmer. Just talking a little bit about Hutchinson's, crop, uh, agricultural uh, advisors and distributors. <coughs> The average age of the, of the farmer in the UK is 56, and actually the average age of the agronomist in the UK is 56. And uh, as a company, it's something that we've been very concerned about, 
uh, is uh, the uh, ageing population of agronomists and succession. So we're, we're quite proud that we've got uh, 60 agronomists in the five, first five years of their career. And here they are. And, and um, they, um, our average age of our agronomists is now 48. So we've invested very heavily in that. Uh, you might notice that, um, that it's male orientated profession. Um, we have, I think, seven female agronomists out of our 200. But generally, the, the, the profession is generally male dominated. I'm going to talk to you about two of these people, actually. <coughs> and uh, one of those agronomists, this is, this is Charles. Charles is an agronomist in Lincolnshire. There he is with his, with his barley. And I'll tell you a little bit about how he spends his day. So he uh, has lots of meetings in farm kitchens and farm offices with, the, with, his, uh, with his clients after having gone into the fields. He's, uh, he drives probably over 100 miles a day, probably about 120 miles a day, every day he does that. You can always get hold of him, he'll answer the phone whatever time of day, you, and, and, the, and he doesn't know the difference between work and pleasure. And actually that's, or work and leisure, sorry. And many, many agronomists are like that, actually it's seamless, it's seamless. They don't know when they're at work and they don't know when they're not, really. Um, and it's a way of life, it's a way of life for them. Uh, absolutely passionate about what they do and they'll start in their agronomy profession from maybe with an agricultural degree or an agricultural qualification of some sort and uh, they'll often stay in that profession for the whole of their career. Uh, Hutchinson's have many, many people that are celebrating it uh, 20, 30, 40 years with the company. We have a very uh, uh, settled uh, mm. um, so, modern technology has, has changed, uh, changed the, the agronomy job over uh, the last 25 years. When I started as an agronomist, there wasn't really such a thing as a mobile phone. And uh, that is absolutely key now to, to what Charles, the agronomist, does. And he has an iPad as well, so he can be mobile. So. Um, and he can, he can has, has all his phone numbers and all his field records, he can access that, and he can access the internet when he's out and about. And he has a laptop, so he can go home and uh, 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 he can write his prescriptions, we call them recommendations, <laughs> but he can write his prescriptions. And the cloud is very important, so the fact that he can access the internet on all those devices, um, and they're all synchronised together, is, is really a valuable thing. So they're the, they're the tools of his trade. Um, other tools that he needs, uh, he might well have a scalpel out there with him when he's in the fields and he'll be using that to cut plants open to have a look at crop growth stages and that makes a difference to uh, how you how will you advise on these crops. So he'll have a scalpel with him. Uh, I used to always carry a scalpel with me, a blade like that on my key ring which was um, really good until I went through East Midlands Airport. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyway, that's another story. But he might, have a, he might also have with him uh, a hand lens, so he can have a look at uh, pest diseases close up and see what they're doing, what stages they're at. They're at. Uh, but most importantly, uh, he'll have his dinner <laughs> and a flask with him. And uh, the reason I put those on it was to remind me, just to say that an agronomist will probably walk 10 or 12 miles a day, five days a week. So quite a physical profession, really. Um, Quite hard on the body, especially in the, 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 uh, the spring and the summer. So that's Charles then. And, and may I ask another question? That sure. is, uh, that's really great, and you've made the analogy with um, doctors. Doctors go to medical schools. Yeah. So which uh, medical school or work school would yeah. they go to? Because I do, I have lots of friends at Y. Yeah, which so was a great uh, agricultural college, which is now closed down. There, are, there are some uh, like like there will be universities that are um, recognised for the medical profession. It's the same for agriculture, actually, and um, 
Harper Adams used to be agricultural college, is now a university, very well respected. Um, the Royal Agricultural College. The Simon Sister. Yes, used to be the Royal Agricultural College, is now a university, university very yes. well respected. Yes. Um, Bangor, Aberystwyth, Nottingham, uh, Reading, Newcastle. I hope I'm not going to miss any out. But all well known. So there is a, there's a number of very well respected right. um, uh, educational establishments. I, I think um, not the same type of training in the fact that our agronomy trainees, they come to us with a an agricultural qualification or a scientific qualification, be it biochemistry, chemistry, yeah. biology. Uh, it could be a degree in uh, crop protection or agriculture. And then they will also have some um, practical farming experience when they come to us. So they may well have taken a, a sort of sabbatical year, if you like, or a gap year and, and had a year on a farm if they're not from farming background. And then they spend, um, a year with an agronomist and go out and do uh, training to, to, to get their qualification um, and the qualification the, the qualification that they need to advise in, in crop protection is, is, is called the basis qualification which is the British Agrochemical Standards Inspection Scheme. So that's a, it's quite a different sort of, and, and I suspect not we're nowhere near so intensive as a medical training. Um, love, love it on the job. And um, it doesn't, it, the, the degrees can come from a variety of backgrounds. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. And actually, this video that I'm going to show is, is one of our agronomists that was in that lineup, and he um, he um, he made this video. He was asked to make this video uh, aimed at new entrants to the profession. So, <clears throat> if our sound works. Um, this is a little three or four minute video of Richard Dorney, who is an agronomist with Hutchinson's, talking about his job. Let's see if it works. Uh, I'm Richard Dorney, I am 32 years old and I work for HL Hutchinson Limited as an agronomist. An agronomist, uh, in a nutshell, is possibly the simplistic term, is a crop doctor. It's all aspects of, of sort of farm management and, and crop husbandry. It's agrochemicals, crop nutrition, best practices, um, a lot of uh, environmental stewardship uh, involved, you know, trying to look after the environment. So I advise farmers on um, the best course of action to look after their crop. It's important on a variety of aspects. It's important uh, to look after the environment. It's important to, for the profitability of the farmer. Um, it's important to get the best out of the crops and the best out of the soil and, and all of the resources that go into it. Uh, we have um, a select number of clients and we spend our weeks basically going around looking at crops and diagnosing problems. We've got a bit of an idea in our head as to um, what to look at at the right time because that's how we, we know we've been trained. There's an awful lot of research going on. Um, there's an awful lot of um, new technology all the time being showcased uh, uh, every year. You know, there's lots of trial work going on to, to try and better varieties of crops. Uh, you know, the, the ways and means to apply chemistry. It's very, very forward thinking. Farmers are a great bunch. They're very wide and varied as to how they manage the farms and their personalities, and that, that's part of what makes the job interesting. You know, you're dealing with all sorts of different people. You know, there's not the stereotypical farmer type that you uh, sometimes imagine. To get into the, into, in, into the sort of industry, it's a, probably a good idea to get some grounding or hands-on activity uh, on farm, even if you're not uh, necessarily, that's not necessarily the way you want to go, but that's certainly a good grounding and, and people appreciate that. Well, there are lots of opportunities for seasonal harvest working in, um, in school holidays and college um, holiday terms. If you show the right attitude, willing to work hard and um, show willing and put yourself out for people, then that's what people appreciate. If you do that, you go a long way. It's, it's, a, it's a great way of life. Um, as long as you get what you've got to get done, uh, you can pretty much work the hours you want, you know, as long or as, and as hard or as short as you want. Freedom, you're not in a, in a fixed place day in, day out, you know, you sort of 
pretty much your own boss almost. So it's great. I love it. Yeah, really, really enjoy it. Into, into Richard's work, and um, actually we have um, we have two um, hundred agronomists that are that passionate mm. about their work. Really, they might not probably speak so well about it, but they really uh, really engrossed in what they do. So um, we, we we get to show this graph quite a bit. Actually, we've got the world population of. 7 billion and the agronomist sees it as his job to uh, maximise yield uh, for, for minimum spend uh, and, and help us feed the world and as, as you've seen it yourself, the, the world population is growing. Um, so, this, this is, this is um, this is a, another agronomist there with his client. This is Simon with his client, and um, they're out there having a, inspecting the fields. I put the note there. I mentioned I mentioned about the qualification. The qualification is called the basis qualification, so that that, that qualifies an advisor to advise on crop protection, and um, the the advisor um, as, as you in the medical profession world, uh, will be required each year to, to um, have continuing professional development so that he maintains his status on the register. Uh, there's a whole range of other qualifications that agronomists often opt for uh, so that they can advise on fertiliser, uh, on the environment, but actually the main qualification for an advisor on crop protection is, is the basis qualification. So an agronomist might advise on the environment. Um, there are lots of small incentive uh, schemes for farmers, for the farmers to enhance, enhance the environment, and agronomists will support this. Uh, environment being key, uh, obviously uh, maintaining or increasing the bee population encourages uh, pollination and certainly important for uh, the field margins and, and the hedgerows, but also for pollination of um, some arable crops. What's the flower in the Sorry? What is the flower? That's Cassilia. That's what it's Yeah. Down to Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, beautiful yeah. yeah, but not a very common crop. No, it's that would be grown in a field. That, that Where I took that actually is at Rawford Bridge, which is something right. like that. Uh, in a field margin. It was grown in a field margin specifically to <coughs> enhance uh, uh, wildlife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, This is another thing that an agronomist might want. So I'll just explain what this is. This is a this is a field of maize. Yeah. And that's a legume. Yeah. So the legume is a companion crop. Yeah. So what the legume does is fix the nitrogen and the maize will take the nitrogen out of the out of the soil. So the two crops work together. Mm. And it's quite good because the vetch, the vetch sits right there in the bottom of the, of the crop. So it doesn't compete at all uh, for light or water uh, with the maize. Another little environmental scheme that we, you might see on a farm would be in woodland piles of logs like this. So it's a refuge for small mam mammals or insects, um, which many insects are beneficial to arable crops and we need to enhance them. Anybody have an idea what that might be? What that might be? That's that's actually what's called a beetle bank. That, in a in a big field, uh, that area is specifically left, and it's a it's a sort of hump of soil down the middle of the field, and um, it's designed to be a home for beetles, beneficial beetles, and um, f um, not only will they uh, enhance the biodiversity of the field, but also a food for birds and. Uh, General soil health. Are farmers keen to do these sort of things? Or is it a small pay? financial incentives? Yeah. 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 Uh, quite complicated, actually. Uh, there's certainly not a um, yeah um, certainly not a 
a get rich quick thing, but, but, but actually uh, complicated, but they are um, with advice they will do these things. Mm. So also, well, not like any of the extensive schemes that we see then in, uh, in medicine where they're very straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very common thing that you'll yeah. see if you're out walking in the countryside. You'll see field margins that are left. And um, so we've got a field margin there. It's uncultivated. Uh, it's not had any pesticides on it, no fertiliser on it. It's a haven for wildlife. And... Um, Farmers uh, will not be able to apply pesticides most of the time um, within these certain field margins. Um, there is a saying that um, a farmer, uh, somebody, said, somebody called John Mar Marsden said, which is, uh, live as though you will die tomorrow, farm as though you will live forever. And so the farmers see it themselves as the guardians of the countryside. And mm. so by enhancing the biodiversity, uh, they look after the countryside. The bigger the field, the smaller proportion of margin. It is, it is, yeah, yeah. It's very important by a watercourse, uh, oh, yes. keeping pesticides out of a watercourse. And what the farmer's done here, he knows that he cannot, he, he's not allowed to spray his pesticides within, let's say, uh, five metres of the watercourse. And so he's thinking, actually, I'm not, I need to, I need to apply my uh, fertiliser and my pesticides onto my crop, so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to grow any crop there, mm. and we'll leave that over to grassland, and that way he's sure that he's going to keep his pesticides mm. out of water. Mm -hmm. The drinking water directed limit is 0.1 part per billion uh, of uh, pesticide, and that's the equivalent of a, effectively a, a granule, uh, that will sit on the end of my finger um, in a ditch one metre deep, one metre wide for 30 kilometres. So the drinking water directed limit for pesticides is very, very low. Some pesticides can be cleaned out of water and the water companies spend a lot of time doing it. Some of them can't be. And those that can't be uh, are under threat to be removed from the market and no longer used by growers. Will that change with Brexit? Um, I, I don't know actually, John. I, I don't really know. I, I would have thought not, honestly. I would have thought not. I, thought I think a lot, lot of things will change. Not to go into Europe, so huh? I can't. The food, <coughs> yeah. the, 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 all the passport control on food into yeah. Europe, it, it can't. It can't. Yeah. Okay. Small incentive schemes for, for, for laid hedges. Uh, laid hedge being a better barrier, it'll live longer, better. Um, uh, environment for wildlife. It's all sorts of uh, schemes and incentives that agronomists will get involved with uh, outside of the main um, job of looking after their crops. So, so here's a field of wheat taken in, uh, in June, uh, a little bit closer up on the, on the ear here. There's a grain side, so that's where the grain of wheat will sit, and there's, mm -hmm. there's a, some pollen there, mm -hmm. taken in the middle of June. So, wheat, obviously the main arable combinable crop grown, grown for, for biscuits or for, um, for bread, for example. Sown in September, and generally harvested in August. And we have a rotation, so we rotate the crops around so that we... Um, um, and the, the agronomist will advise on the a rotation, so we rotate the crops around to give the fields a rest from pest disease, weeds, uh, to give the nutrition a time to recover. Oilseed rain, uh, another very, a very popular crop, but very difficult for farmers to make actually any money out of. Sown in August, harvested in July, because the, the price of oilseed rape is, is, is not what it was. Do you know what that, that is? Recognise that? Yeah, so, that's, so that's barley, uh, grown either for feed or for malting. Uh, barley is grown for malting generally where the soil is much lighter, much, much sandy. Uh, most is grown for feed. And with my photographer's eye, this is um, barley blowing in the wind in Leicestershire where I, where I live. 
Do you really know what that is? That is flax, yeah. So that's flax seed or linseed. Um, harvested later than uh, wheat, barley or oilseed rape. Uh, a nightmare to harvest because the, the stems are so tough um, and used for hemp. And, uh, the oil that actually is used, solidified oil, is um, what goes into linoleum. But this is linseed, and you will recognise it has either blue or white flowers in July. And uh, when I was on my way to Selby one day, I noticed the joy in West. Two people had used two different varieties, so there's the white and, and, and the uh, mauve together. So one of the last crops to be harvested, which an agronomist will uh, uh, advise on, this is, uh, this is maize, and this has uh, just been harvested. Uh, recently, I think most of it's probably finished now. This will take the length of silage. This will be animal feed. Yes, mm. this is be animal feed, and it's harvested when the uh, when the corn is at a certain uh, maturity, depending on the sugars in the corn, and then it's um, it goes to this animal feed. But being a company, we uh, stretches all around the countryside, uh, uh, from from Cornwall and out to Lincolnshire. We we have quite a diverse range of crops. We, we have uh, bulbs as well, uh, but in, in Cornwall and Lincolnshire. We we'll advise farmers on cultivations, and um, really what we like to do is to be able to help the farmer to uh, cultivate as efficiently as possible, to do the, the best job possible, uh, use cultivations to prepare the ground for the next crop. Um, but also not waste a lot of money doing it because driving a plough up and down the field uses a lot of diesel, a lot of wearing parts. So we don't want recreational cultivation, but we'll help farmers make those cultivation decisions. The crop grows in the ground. This is this is wheat, and um, the, the seed is either purchased from uh, from a merchant such as ourselves, or the farmer can save their own seed actually. And if a farmer um, so it was about 100 kilograms per hectare of seed. The return on it would be um, 10,000 or 15,000 kilograms. So you get 100 or 150 to 1 for every seed that you put in. And, and that, that, that return has got to pay obviously for all these inputs and all, and all, all the cultivations, uh, or all the labour, rent. We need an agribusiness expert. <laughs> so there we are. That's this is sowing. The seed go. The seed is, goes down these shoots here, and that's seed being sown. Fertilizer. Uh, agronomists will advise on fertilizing. This is a this is a granular fertilizer being spread, uh, being thrown out from these spinners. Spreads 24 meters across the field. Fertilizer generally in. Um, in, in uh, big bags, so half ton bags or 600 kilogram bags, and um, all farmers using com growing combined or crops will will purchase fertilizer and need specific advice on on nutrient management. And farmers have to produce nutrient management plans. They have to produce those. That's a, uh, a legal for whom? requirement uh, for government. For the government, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Charles had that hand lens, and this is the sort of thing you'll be using to look at his hand lens. Yellow rust, yeah, yeah. This is yellow rust, uh, and this is a disease that we see in the crops in the spring. And this is something that um, agronomists fear, and uh, they will have a, a, a program of fungicides in place to try and uh, stop this spreading throughout the crops. Do you uh, treat and prophylactic? Yes. Therapy? Yeah, we treat prophylactically. Yeah, so a, fu a fungus, a, a crop would have, on average, of three fungicide treatments. But what we what we do is, uh, the, the farmer will decide. Um, he'll choose a variety, and one thing that he'll be able to do when he chooses that variety is look at the rating uh, of disease resistance um, to to yellow rust and to other diseases. So a high disease rating, uh, less chance of needing. I suspect this is something that you might well have seen even on the national press. And this is this is blackgrass. And this is a, a weed that has become 
really quite delicious over the last few years. This is a field of wheat, actually, oh my with black grass. And so the black grass uh, competes with the wheat and can uh, considerably rob the yield. And where does black grass come from? I don't remember hearing it. I don't actually know where it's actually come from. Um, because it got sown with the seed. Yeah, and it, yeah, I don't know where it actually originated. Do you know where it originated? Black grass started, uh, we first saw black grass coming into uh, cereal crops back in probably the early, early, early 70s. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the big problems was where people was um, not ploughing, there was direct ploughing uh, into, into stubbles and not removing the previous problems from the previous year. And black grass established itself. It's a bit like cooch, as you know, as right. yeah. did. Yeah. Um, and, and rye grass. There's, there's numerous things uh, that establish themselves through probably poor management of the soil. Really. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's resistant to many herbicides now, yeah. and uh, we're now turning back towards cultivations, the old-fashioned techniques, if you like, uh, as a way to control it. Mm. Um, but will the seed contaminate the seed that the farmer's planting? In other words, if he's planting wheat, will that seed crop contain no. black grass seed? No, because it's if you it be remember the out. you probably can't remember seeing the wheat seeds. Yeah. Mm. The wheat seeds are much bigger than the black grass seeds. Okay. So, so they it's basically separated, separated out. Yeah. The main mm. problem is it contaminates the soil, yeah. and it germinates mm. in early autumn. <clears throat> Right. It germinates mm -hmm. alongside uh, arable crops mm -hmm. right. and it just competes with them. Right. Um, so we're now looking at later drilling so that let the, we let the uh, black grass uh, germinate, mm -hmm. grow, kill it off, yes. then, then sow our arable mm -hmm. crops yes. or even spring drilling. Yes. Um, but uh, uh, infestation mm -hmm. like that will halve or more the certification of seed removes the, that situation ah, from okay. the seed crop. Right. Yeah. The, the seed crops are inspected uh, quite regularly, so if there's a wheat, there's a wheat crop growing for seed, yes. then it would be quite uh, regularly inspected. If there's any level of black grass, then it would be rejected right. as a right. seed crop. So right. there's a lot of uh, uh, some roguing goes on, manual roguing of, of problem weeds out, out of the seed crop. But right. So there's a certification that has to get through there. Uh, right. Black grass is more prevalent in, in, in certain areas than others. Um, north, northern England, a lot less. lot less. Uh, Yorkshire, quite prevalent. Heavier soils, prevalent. Cambridge, and the Midlands, where I am. Yeah. If you ever see a field of poppies, and it's an arable field, it's usually because something's gone wrong. Usually. There's a slight chance it's grown for morphine production, but but, but very remote tr remote chance. Uh, there are fields in Lincolnshire that have grown for that, but actually, if you see the field of poppies, it's probably gone wrong. Um, I, I, so this is a field of barley with some poppies in. When I was a practicing agronomist, I went to a field in Leicestershire, which I used to look after, and it had all gone wrong. And the field was red. You could have seen it from outer space. And that was on a Friday. And uh, I walked into the field, and it was when we all had film cameras, and as I stopped in the field, where I stopped there was a track in the field, the field was red, and just where I stopped were empty film boxes of 24 exposure 30. <laughs> <laughs> somebody had been there photographing them, and I came home and I said to my wife, I can't believe that the people have been photographing that field, how embarrassing. And the next morning, I came downstairs as the newspaper came through the door, and it was the Sunday Telegraph. <laughs> and on the back page of the Sunday Telegraph was this, I could see this big splodge of red. And I picked it up, and it was Mr. Farmer from Beecham, Staffordshire. Didn't know how this field had got as red as it possibly had. <laughs> and it was, it was that the same field that was on the poppies. So if you see field of poppies, something's usually gone wrong. Um, so, crop protection then. Um, the advisor, uh, the, cr the crop doctor, the agronomist, has a, a basic certificate so they can advise on crop protection. It's, it is illegal for anyone to purchase pesticides unless 
uh, they are sure that the person that is going to actually put them through the machine has a suitable qualification. So it's, a, it's against the law to do that. Uh, the person that is spraying though, is actually driving that tractor, he has to have a qualification and he also has to take an annual, he has to have CPD points, mm -hmm. he has to take an annual update as well uh, to keep him up to date with the latest techniques. Does he have a sperm count every year as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, there, are, um, yeah. there are certain health monitoring um, yeah, yeah. programs, aren't there? Mm -hmm. um, and you can sign, I think, spare apprentices have all been told they can sign up for, I can't remember the name of it now, but I remember telling some spare apprentices last year, if you want to sign up for this health monitoring thing, if you're worried about your health in any way, you can do. Mm -hmm. um, it probably at the end it will come to me. So the agronomist makes his prescription, oh, and on, on his prescription he has to put lots of information, including the active ingredient, the harvest interval, so that's the latest time that it can be sprayed before harvest. Uh, the distance from a water course, you saw a water course. The rate of application, the water volume, the name of the field, the crop, the variety, uh, the growth stage, and what's called the map number, which is the registration number that the government give the particular product that's being used. Um, so that goes, all goes on there, and then when the operator sprays it, he has to record when he did it, what the weather conditions were, how windy it was, what the direction of the wind was, uh, uh, what the relative humidity was, um, the date he started, the, date he finished, the, the time he started and finished, and he has to keep those records for five years. So there's quite a lot of administration. A lot of this now is starting to be done electronically. Um, the, the office spray operator might have an iPad in his cab and he can fill this in electronically. Um, but a lot of paperwork that, uh, that goes with it. Does anybody ever actually look at the paperwork? Yeah, yeah they do. <laughs> they do actually. Um, farmers um, join assurance schemes and they have to join an assurance scheme so they can sell their grain and they have annual inspections. But on top of that, Farmers have a subsidy and the Rural Payments Agency will come and look at their records and they will think nothing of just taking 5% of their subsidy if the, rec the records are not right. And they know exactly what to look for. So it's, it's quite ruthless actually, so it's very important the records are right. Yeah, there's a protocol that, uh, I mean, they need a passport with the, if the wheat's going to mill, they need a passport with that to what's happening so they can read behind the scenes to what, they, that, what that crop's had. Um, there's a lot of protocols in potatoes. Um, Heinz Babyfield has got the biggest protocol behind the scenes. And there's nothing that they'll know exactly what everything's had on the date, what the weather was doing exactly before it becomes in a can or in a bag thing that you see at the supermarket. And you can actually ask, which we often do, because we always test the supermarkets, um, you can actually ask the supermarket where that product's come from, and they can actually drill right back to where it was, what farm it was from. Okay. Yeah, so you can trace it back from the shelf right back yeah. to, the, mm -hmm. to the field. So I thought I'd just put in four slides about the discovery of, of, of pesticide molecules. Um, but you might be quite interested in this. Uh, the whole process, uh, 800 requirements need to be addressed, and they carry out uh, more than 200 studies, and uh, without going through the registration pro process, a, a pesticide cannot be marketed in any way. Uh, and, and BSF claim that um, plant protection products are the most scrutinised substances apart from medis medicines. The, the whole process, we start off with maybe uh, 100,000 uh, uh, molecules <coughs> to end up with just one, and the, the process will take um, eight, eight to ten years. Cost of that, uh, well in 2002 it was about 200 million to bring one molecule to market, I think now it's about 300 million. Uh, one of the large agrochemical companies that I was with in Cambridge last week and they said at their centre in Indianapolis uh, they have 300 PhD qualified scientists working on new molecules and at their centre in Indianapolis. So that's just one, one company. So 
development of a molecule, and there are a lot less coming to market now, a lot less coming to market. Uh, it's expensive, it's time consuming. We have an armory of about 650 pesticides that we recommend, uh, probably 250 for arable crops. Um, and at any one time, probably a third of those are under threat. The license to use them expires, or um, there's, at the moment, a whole range of our products are under threat as being perceived endocrine disruptors. Mm. Uh, we have problems with pesticides in watercourses. There's been a scare recently about uh, one particular product being cancerous glyphosate. And um, you might have heard about neonicotinoids, which is a seed dressing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. As a result of neonicotinoid seed dressing being withdrawn on oilseed rape, 70,000 hectares of oilseed rape has failed in the ground mm -hmm. this, this autumn. Mm -hmm. And if you today, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's an expensive job. Machinery is expensive. And um, some machines are 100,000, 200,000. This is an expensive job. Um, you saw Richard with his sampling core, he, had, he was sampling the soil, he was putting that in and he was sampling the soil so he could have a look at the soil profile and he can send that off for testing. With quite modern sampling techniques you, you can produce uh, um, maps like this for a field. So this is a field and all the different colours give you an idea of the, the levels of, in this case it's pH actually, mm -hmm. but it could, be, it could be something else. And so it changes across the field. Mm -hmm. And with use of modern technologies and what we call precision farming and GPS technology in the CAV, uh, farmers can actually react to those variable maps and instead of putting the same inputs across the whole field, they can increase it and decrease it and tra really try and tailor it to what the field needs. So they're not putting more on where it's not needed and they're not putting less on where they need more. Um, so that's precision farming technology and that can be done for uh, phosphate levels or potash levels or um, it can be done for pH or it can be done for a whole wide range of things. Also, drones uh, are in uh, use now, and this is one of our drones. Uh, we have five people that are qualified to fly drones, and whether it be from a drone or from a satellite or from a sensor on a tractor, we can produce maps like this, and these are called NDVI maps, and they, this one will be a map taken in the spring, and it gives us an idea of the pigmentation in the leaves of the crops, and by Understanding the pigmentation of the leaves of the crops, we can then make decisions as to how we apply fertilizer uh, or how, we dis how much seed we're going to put on. And with variable rate technology, then we can react to that. So we're really trying to tailor what's going on in the field uh, by use of um, these multispectral images. We also carry out Hutchinson's and many other agricultural companies. There are five big agricultural companies in the, in the country really, five very big ones. Um, we carry out our own trials, and this is actually a photograph down at Ledbury, uh, taken with a drone, of our own replicated trials. And we'll invite uh, our growers to come and walk around the trials and have a look at them for ourselves. Themselves. And then in the winter we'll produce results and feed back to them what we've found and what we think they should do. Uh, so they get an idea of, of what varieties uh, or what fertiliser regimes, or what um, uh, uh, agrochemical uh, programmes will suit the Ledbury soil type, so the Ledbury farmers could come and have a look at their own situation effectively. effectively. And there we are, there's some of our, um, our clients having a look around some trials, and that's a, a sort of common thing for us in June, July, we have we run, we run trials. We have a trial site at Annick actually, and just to finish, just to finish, I'm just going to show you the uh, a short uh, video of the trial site that was taken at Annick with the drone. So we flew over the, the, the farmer there at the trial site at Annick. He's got the drone and he thought it would be quite good to, to, to send the drone up and, and just fly over the trial site. I'm just going to show you, this is my last slide of, um, of my last little uh, bit of film. It's about a minute and it's the drone flying over the trial site uh, at Annick. And I, you might be quite interested in this bit of film. and it won't take
Don't worry, I can go, I'll go and find it. No, I can't find it. I'm sorry, but I cannot show you that. That's why. I'm very sorry about that. Have we got any more questions at all? Certainly. Yeah. You mentioned the problem with dust in the spring crops, and also farmers complain about losing crops because of flooding and that. Why, in the last sometime in the last 10, 15, 20 years, have farmers changed from planting in the autumn? rather than planting in the spring, you still harvest at the same time later in the summer. We just don't understand... Uh, why would they why change? Why would they plant, plant in the autumn instead of planting in the spring? Yeah, when all the problems uh, main, with diseases and things... Well, like mainly because um, most of the time um, um, a spring crop may yield... Let's, let's take a spring wheat crop. A spring wheat crop may yield 7.5 tonnes a hectare. A winter, wheat, a winter wheat crop may yield... Twelve and a half tons mm. hectare. Oh, um, now that's all very well, providing you haven't got weed burdens that you can't control, and then you've got to go back to the spring, uh, the spring crop. But actually, um, it's a profitability thing, really. It, may, it makes it, it makes it hard work because harvest happens in August, and they've got to turn around, cultivate, and get the crops in straight away. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, 30 years ago, there would be more spring crop. I think we're going to see a reversion to, to some spring crop. What do you do about the guys, the naughty guys then, the guys who don't use your services or yes. alike? There must be farmers chucking stuff about out there. And we know there are. Um. <laughs> <laughs> there are always breaks in every profession. I think um, some, some farmers are basis qualified themselves. But I think most farmers would use that are using pesticides would take some advice because it's too expensive for them to, um, and there's too much legislation for them not to take advice. Well, if they're not qualified themselves, with, if they've not got a basis qualification, then they've probably got a criteria where um, the documentation um, to the crop has got to be obtained from a qualified individual. If they're not qualified themselves, then they would struggle and yeah. marketing that crop with no assurance, then there's a lot of merchants who would not buy that crop. Mm -hmm. So it's money in the end. It's a control. Basically, yeah. Basically, it's documentation, really. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's red, red tape, for better word, yeah. which no doubt you're all very much aware of. Yeah. <laughs> How species selective or disease selective are the pesticides and the uh, fungicides? I mean, I'm thinking with the pesticides in particular, how species selective are the different molecules you can get? I mean, is it one pest? Uh, product, as it were. No, I think. Yeah. The, no, do you answer that? Yeah, yeah the multi-site, the multi-site fungicides would be able to react as a protecting fungicide, whether it was uh, mildew, amphetamine, I think we relate to brown rust, yellow rust, mildew, septoria, um, ringosporum in barley. So, so they would react to certain fungicides, which would relate to if you've got a particular variety of wheat, which is very susceptible to say septoria you would load the fungicide towards controlling that septoria. But it would also have a multi-site situation where it would control the disease as well. Pest-wise, you basically, uh, if it's an aphid that you're trying to control, then, you know, aphicide. But if it's beyond there, if you're trying to control things like flea beetles or things like that, then there would be more specific pesticides used. Um, the simplicity of our industry now, I think, is fair to say that I would say toothpaste is far more toxic than anything else that would anything that we're using crops to do. I just worry about sort of blanket use of insecticides and yeah, I, the I, the and, entire field is and we are we concerned. So you've got to have the right advice to justify an application, for a better word. And picking up the point from my ear about farmers, do they blanket spray one or two may blanket spray because they panic. Um, and I, you know, you know, it's a bit, bit like I'm not going to quote anything in your industry, but 
Um, you know, it's it's obviously you know, if you look at antibiotics and things like that, how they've been used in the past and how we use them now, that's a bit similar to the to the pesticide use of, of old. Uh, do you give advice to organic growers? I mean, most of what you've well, been saying no, does, does not, to me, appear to be for organic growers. We have two, two arms to our company, and we, um, we do have one, one of our companies, one of our brands, is specifically advice. And we will have organic farmers amongst them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. amongst those, certainly, yeah. yeah. So, um, Yes, is the answer to that. A lot of the organic farming, it's hard work, a lot of the organic farming industry tend to tend to utilise uh, a lot of trace elements for form mm, control, yeah. like copper for fungicides yeah, 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 and yeah, things yeah. like that. So they probably yeah. use things like that. Yeah. And we would advise yeah. organic farmers, yeah. and we would have our some of our clients which will produce organic produce you know, for certain for certain markets. Yeah. If there's a future when genetically modified crops will be able to be developed that will be not mean spraying, will be so disease resistant that they won't need the animals. Don't mean to answer that. Yeah, Gary can I was very fortunate back in the eighties to to spend time. Uh, in the states when genetically enhanced cropping come through uh, and we anticipated within our business that genetically enhanced cropping would be here by year 2000, it never happened and, and you all know what's happening in Europe so, yes. so basically I think uh, certain parts of the world that want to feed, feed the world is down that route. Um, I don't know if you saw the documentary on the um, mosquitoes that were being controlled and by genetic modification, which is which is everybody's chuffed about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if our industry come up with a with a cure for cancer by genetically modifying crops, then we'd all be we'd be all chuffed about that. Uh, so it will happen eventually. It's happening gradually. Um, certain parts of Europe are supportive, others aren't. But I think. I'd like to think in my lifetime that uh, we'll have enhanced uh, cropping within Europe. Okay, tell us about uh, biodiversity and uh, pollinators and bumblebees and uh, neonicotoid cannabis. Whether I believe that it. Um, well, there's been a lot of debate. There has been. Neonicotinoids have been banned in Europe at the stage when they weren't in England. Um, Bumblebee populations have plummeted. Uh, bumblebees from abroad, cream, fertilised creams are imported. Uh, for, for instance, in greenhouse cultures, are very important. Um, not necessarily genetically compatible with either species or strains of local bumblebees. Um, there seem to be very serious threats to the biodiversity of country and uh, to our insect, um, cross-sex of our insect pollination, which may have quite serious implications for the I think the thing about, uh, for me, <coughs> about the ban of neonicotinoids mm. is, um, is the ban of neonicotinoids is, because of the perceived threat from mm. the disease, has put the Aussie grape crop under threat. Mm. And so that's that's a lot of that's failed now, as I said. But actually, uh, the, the, the neonicotinoid it was a seed dressing, so that goes in the ground. It's very placed, mm -hmm. and it's on it's on the Aussie grape seed. But without that, the problem the flea beetle, the flea beetle mm -hmm. has then been sprayed and sprayed and sprayed, and actually, it's even worse. It's even worse. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, the industry, our industry have been uh, working and developing uh, more um, of, a, of a pesticide approach on, on a seed coating mm. because that would be more environmentally friendly than foliar spraying. Mm. So that was what the industry was asked to do and that is a continuation of um, seed biotech companies are, are mm. developing that all the time. The neonicotine was, uh, was a bit of a stumbling block because I think evidence wasn't, there was evidence in France that that was suggested, but the, the evidence that they found was not really, mm. we can go on, we can talk about this all night, because we've been heavily involved in this. 
Um, the downside to, to, to it is that we're probably full of spraying all seed rate, um, probably four or five times where we never had to do it when we had near nicotine mm -hmm. on the seed. And I, I think from an environmental point of view, um, there's a lot of politics. Incidentally, uh, yeah. incidentally the, 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 um, the, the way it works with, or should work with farmers spraying when there are beehives mm -hmm. is the farmer should give beekeepers 48 hours notice of applying a, a pesticide. Right. And um, if, if the relationship is such, the, they'll, they'll decide between them what time of day the farmer will go and spray. And uh, it'll either be late in the morning or, or sorry, uh, late at night or very early in the morning when the bees hopefully aren't in the crop and foraging. Um, so there is, and there are things, there are uh, representatives called. Uh, be liaison officers, I think, mm. be they, uh, uh, who act as intermediaries mm. for um, the spray operator and the and the beekeeper. Now there's a honeybee, you know, a bumblebee is a different creature. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Has a much different lifestyle. Mm. In fact, a different way. Yeah. I think if you physically walk, in, I mean, when you're physically walking crops at certain times of the year, like also rate like beans. I can assure you that there's an awful lot of bees in there, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's just one of these areas that we can pick up on all sorts. We can talk about bees, we can talk, talk about field mice, we can talk about anything. Um, but you know, there's issues there which um, is across all parts of the world, and it's just the intensity of trying to feed everybody. I think is a big. Yeah. So, uh, Andrew Garrick you, you mentioned that there's that slide of the growth in world population from the US census data. And of course it's important to grow more food, but we know that a vast proportion of food goes to wastage. So mm. what techniques can be used to grow food that doesn't waste as much? Mm. You know, when we've got 40, 70 percent of the crop wasted before it reaches the shop. <laughs> it's a massive point. I mean the the preserving of food is, is a bit is a big issue. Is a massive issue. Yeah. And finding the quality of food and shortening the gap. If I look at a vine in P for argument's sake, from mm -hmm. vine to freezing, it's only hours, yeah. and it's a matter of preserving the freshness of the food, and probably getting it to parts of, of where we need it. Um, sadly, there's all parts of third world, for argument's sake, we can't get it there, mm -hmm. um, and the affordability is put on there, so it's a big issue, but that's a world issue, isn't it? I mean, we know that the, the population is going to grow, we predicted where, I mean, you see, I, I'm sure in your industry you see these figures. Uh, because if I was trying to manage the NHS for argument's sake, then that must be a massive issue for you to look at, to what happened in 2050. Um, and, uh, with, <laughs> well, yeah. I told Andrew I was going to bring that up when he saw the presentation. But no, it's, you know, I mean, I think we're all, our aim is the same, isn't it, really? We, we've got to look after the population, whether we're feeding them or keeping them healthy. And it's a big issue for us all. Right? Keep spraying, reduce the sperm count, the population drops. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall, yeah, I hope you've got that comment on video. <laughs> so, so, shall I finish with this yeah. video yeah. I want to show you? Yeah. So, so, this is the drone, and this is the farmer, Annick, and the farmer decided he was going to go and uh, uh, film the filmed the trial site from above. You saw the plot, didn't you, with Ledbury? So, the, the drone took off. And um, it's, only about, it's only 33 seconds this video actually. The drone took off. Do you want to see a little bit of filming, filming the plot? So here we go. Brilliant! Brilliant! Oh, that's brilliant! And there's the plot. <laughs> 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 so, 
coming up from the ewes uh, behind the barrier bank uh, and it got to uh, uh, about um, 15 feet from the top of the barrier bank I think it wasn't as bad as 2000 but obviously all the crops behind there um, were wiped out um, um, but I never realised and thought about it how optimistic Yorkshire farmers are because <laughs> They've all been re-sown already this year, so obviously whilst they've had to have spring over we this year, they're banking on no flooding again yeah. next well, year. That sounds about right. right. <laughs> <laughs> they've mended the gears for the frost on that. Huh? They've mended the gears for the frost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the trouble is that actually made the flooding behind us less. Yes. Uh, I think that the wind had been fuller if um, they hadn't had the problems in York. Yeah. Um, but it was quite dramatic actually just seeing it coming yeah. up behind this beautiful sunny day. Yeah. And watching all the the wildlife um, yeah. running up through the uh, through the um, old ship there. Yeah. So, but thank you very much thank indeed. You I really enjoyed. Mm. So. Um, is there any other business anybody wants to raise? No, I just like to ask a question. Is all that wine you sell us? Is, is that sprayed? I can assure you that the majority of people I buy from, like the wines this evening, are yeah. all organic, mm. and more and more of them are biodynamic or biodynamic. Uh, and I look for that particularly. Mm. Uh, I'm really sensitive about the fact that lots of people don't want chemicals in their wine. Mm. So we've moved more and more towards organic and biodynamic. Stuart, what does biodynamic mean? Well, mm. if you've got another hour's lecture. <laughs> <laughs> does that mean we can drink more then? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly not. Sadly not. <laughs> it's a work of rude old Steiner. <laughs> 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 it's a work of rude old It's a work of rude old Steiner. Anyway, the, the, the next well, the next meeting of anything here is in two weeks' time. Your your wine tasting for Christmas, isn't it? Um, in three weeks' time, we've got uh, a, a, an old friend of mine, Dave Richards, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon who's done quite a lot of work with the ombudsman, um, uh, and is now currently the the lead for cardiothoracic surgery at the Department of Health, coming to talk about professionalism in practice, keeping your patients alive and yourself out of trouble. Um, and uh, the 2nd of December, mm. we've got Superheroes, the making of uh, an Iron Man, and one of David's old uh, partners, uh, Mark Williams, and one of our GPs, Sam Rosenberg, both done the uh, Iron Man, and they're coming to talk about their experiences of it. And on the 9th of December, there is the Medical Mastermind, mm. with our quiz master, Mike Stower. <laughs> <laughs> um, for bribes, I'm sure that he will tell you where he's been on holiday so you can at least get some of the, uh, <laughs> the just clues. Been, I've just been over that bridge at Annick. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, thank you very much everybody for coming. Have a nice thank weekend. You. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you.